Cadillac, for many, has been the car that dreams are made of. It stood for luxury and speed. Owning a Cadillac told the world you'd arrived. It became the car for wealthy socialites and the movers and shakers. Cadillac turned heads and melted hearts. It became an icon of America. Cadillac is riding a wave of renewed popularity. Its sales mushroomed as its edgy new vehicles caught on with buyers. Hip-hop artists flocked to its oversized SUV, the Escalade. Suddenly, General Motors' aging luxury brand had street cred. It had been said that the typical Cadillac owner was between 65 and dead. But as rap stars were joined by suburbanites taking advantage of a tax break that allowed them to write off the purchase price of this monster hauler, things started to look younger. This re-energized brand perked up and went on the attack. Its coming out party at the 2003 Detroit Auto Show created a buzz when the 1,000 horsepower Cadillac 16 concept car rolled out onto the stage. Its presence screamed, we're back. The showrooms were filled with sporty BMW fighting sedans, and these cars started to make believers out of those who'd never considered owning a Cadillac. To keep the pressure up, Cadillac unleashed the XLR, built alongside the Corvette. It looked like Cadillac might once again be called the king of the road. To understand Cadillac's long journey back, we need to go back to the beginning. The auto industry was bursting with ideas in the early years of the 20th century. It seemed that everyone had a new car in development. It was similar to the dot-com boom of later years. Most of these cars were expensive and most weren't very good. A big problem was that there were no standards for making all the parts that went into a car. As a result, things just didn't fit from one car to the next. Building cars was a gamble. This made any form of quality control impossible. It also kept mass production from developing. Henry Leland had an idea. He'd worked for the gunmaker, Colt and seen how it made all the pieces fit together, time after time. He started to use these techniques in his work for the fledgling automaker. Oldsmobile heard of his reputation for precision. In 1901, Ransom Olds asked Leland to build a better engine for his curved dash old. These were the leading seller at the time. Leland's attention to precision gave his engines 27% more horsepower than those built by other suppliers. While Olds didn't use the Leland engine, it demonstrated his work. Word spread about his quality in the tight-knit auto community. Leland met with Henry Ford's investors. They were losing patience with Ford and looking for someone to take over. They'd backed Ford in the Detroit Automobile Company. They wanted to build cars for the rich. Like most people, they wanted to go where they thought the money was. Ford had other ideas. He thought a low-priced car for the masses was the way to go. The money people thought he'd lost his mind and went shopping for a replacement. This was the conventional wisdom. Cars were luxury items that were expensive to build and costly to own. Ford was out at the Detroit Auto Company and Leland was in. 
While Leland was happy to concentrate on catering to the carriage trade, he didn't think Ford was completely wrong about mass production. He just wanted to build a lot of cars for the rich, not the masses. When Leland came on board, he took the name and crest from the French founder of Detroit, Antoine de la Mothe Cadillac, and set to work. His Cadillac automobile company had a single cylinder vehicle with good clearance that helped it to navigate the era's rutted road. Leland's biggest challenge was to find a way to apply his ideas about precision manufacturing to a whole car, not just an engine. But his first breakthrough was a four-cylinder engine. He put one in his personal car, the 1905 Osceola. Leland was tall, and the Osceola had a custom body designed for him. It was the first car with a fully enclosed passenger compartment. While the new engine was a technological success, he was still perfecting his precision manufacturing ideas. He felt that if he could find a way to get all the parts to match from car to car, his vehicles would stand out in the marketplace. A standard for measurement was the key. The Johansson gauge blocks gave him the answer. He bought this box of gauges from a Swedish company and used them to make all of his tooling conform to a standard set of measurements. The accuracy made possible by the blocks made interchangeable parts a reality. High quality mass production was the next step. England's Royal Automobile Club tested his precision built cars and awarded him the Dewar's Cup. The cars became known as the standard of the world. As Cadillac sales grew, the founder of General Motors, Billy Durant, sought to put the luxury brand in his shopping cart. He offered Cadillac's investors over $5 million for the company and took it away. Leland stayed on and started to find that being part of a larger organization gave him the capital to innovate. One of the biggest stumbling blocks to making automobiles more popular was finding a way to eliminate the crank. People got hurt, some even died when the car backfired and the crank twisted out of their hands. In the best case, hand cranking was hard work. Leland approached Charles Kettering and asked him for help. Kettering had perfected a spring mechanism for opening the drawer on cash registers. He thought a modified version would work as a starter on a car. It did. In 1912, Kettering's self-starter became standard equipment on all Cadillacs. Within a few years, almost all American cars had the Kettering electric starter. World War I changed Leland's priorities. He knew that aviation was going to play a large part in this conflict and thought the company should build airplane engines. Durant was a pacifist and didn't want anything to do with the plan. Leland quit Cadillac and started a new company to build Liberty Aero engines. The engines were built too late to see combat, but Leland was free to start Cadillac's rival, Lincoln. When the war ended, Cadillac was ready to build cars for the returning soldiers. After a brief post-war recession, the economy started to boom. Many people became flush with new money made in the stock market, real estate, or the movies. Designing custom bodies for rich people's cars, like this Pierce Arrow, with a body by Harley Earl, was a growth industry. Cadillac noticed that Earl was building quite a business out in California. GM's chairman, Alfred P. Sloan, thought it would be a good idea to have someone with Earl's flair working directly for General Motors. He sent Cadillac's president, Lawrence Fisher, out to California to meet Earl. Fisher convinced him to design a roadster for Cadillac that became known as the LaSalle. The 1927 LaSalle 
was inspired by the European luxury car, the Hispano Suiza. Its classic proportions were a hit, and Sloan asked Earl to become the first stylist to work for a major manufacturer. Leaving sunny California was hard, but Earl went to Detroit and changed the automobile industry forever. Earl's Hollywood style would be challenged by the sudden collapse of the economy. Earl's old hometown trade paper, Daily Variety, described it best. Wall Street lays an egg. In October of 1929, the economy unraveled. Millions of people were thrown out of work. But oddly enough, there was still a market for luxury cars. The rich had money. Auburn, Cord, Duesenberg and others produced the most powerful and stunning cars ever created. It was a golden era for custom-built cars. These were the kings of the classic car age. Cadillac created a V12 and then a V16 engine to power its luxurious land yachts. The V16 was the world's largest automobile engine. It was beautifully styled and had advanced features like an oil filter and air cleaner. This powerful beauty weighed in at 1,500 pounds, about 1,000 pounds more than a modern engine. It was an immediate hit and found its way into the top of the line Cadillacs. This 1931 Satan Red Sport Phaeton from the Cadillac Museum is one of the finest examples of custom-bodied Cadillac. The V16 engine gave the car a top speed of over 95 miles per hour and showed the world that Cadillac could compete in the upper end of the luxury trade. Customers could buy a chassis from Cadillac and then have a stylist build a custom body for them. Or they could choose a limited production body from GM's Fleetwood division. It was a time when the only limitation was one's imagination. This 1937 V16 powered Cadillac was built for a Swiss playboy. He wanted a streamlined car to drive to his favorite haunts along the Riviera. It caused a sensation. Cadillac also refined its V8 engines, and Earl's stylists were finding ways to bring custom touches to mass-produced vehicles. This was the death knell for the custom coach builders. Even the very rich decided to save money and buy mass-produced luxury that was often better built. As the Depression ended, Cadillacs began to show the influence of the streamline and art deco movements. Running boards disappeared, and cars were dripping in luxury. The seats had double-wrapped springs stuffed with down, roll-top cigarette ashtrays, a hidden gasoline filler under the left rear taillight, and the first hint of a tail fin. The 1941 Cadillac Special is a classic, but there wasn't much time to enjoy this car. production stopped and Cadillac joined the war effort. Cadillac turned to building tanks. Its rugged V8 engines and automatic transmissions impressed the army. They were fast and reliable and soldiers were familiar with them. Many had been mechanics before the war and knew how to repair them. This kept the mechanized army on the move. When the war ended in August of 1945, Cadillac scrambled to return to making cars. The first cars off the line after the war were identical to the 1942 Cadillacs. 
they used the same tooling as they had before. It would take several years for the company to develop an all new car. Earl's stylists tried out several prototypes. The winner was inspired by the Lockheed P-38 fighter. Earl loved the jet age, and he loved the plane's tail fin. The fin wars had just begun. Cadillac kept one step ahead of the competition when it introduced a new high compression V8, air conditioning, and fully automatic transmission. General Motors vaults were bursting with money, and no other luxury car maker could keep up with Cadillac. Millionaire sportsman Briggs Cunningham hoped that no one could keep up with his Cadillacs. He took two of the new V8 engine powered cars to race at Le Mans in 1950. The French dubbed one of the massive cars Le Monster or the Monster. This car was fitted with an aerodynamic body designed by an engineer at Grumman. The other was a stock coupe. The two cars came in 10th and 11th overall. Not a bad finish, but Cunningham decided he'd return with a sports car of his own design the next year. Cadillac wasn't a winner on the track, but it was beating the competition in the showroom. Packard didn't have the money to keep up and started to decline. Lincoln was hobbled by the financial mess at its parent company, Ford. Cadillac took advantage of its position and turned out cars with more power and options than ever seen before. It offered a 210 horsepower V8 with a four barrel carburetor and dual exhaust all to move a massive and impressive body. The 1953 Cadillacs sold more than twice as many cars as Lincoln. Riding on the publicity of Cunningham's racing effort, Cadillac showed off its Le Mans concept car in 1954. It boasted a more powerful V8 wrapped in a ground-hugging body. Lincoln's designers took notice and planned a response. The Lincoln Mark II was their attempt to show the world that they could still compete. These low volume cars cost $10,000 in 1956. A valiant effort, but not enough to break Cadillac's leadership grip. Cadillac was selling over 140,000 cars a year by 1955. Lincoln came in second at 35,000. It was the car for enjoying the good life. Cadillac's designers knew how to snare the American male. The car's bumpers sported well-endowed rocket-shaped features, affectionately dubbed Dagmars, after a buxom TV actress. But it was the rear of the car that would ignite the next automotive craze. Chrysler co-opted Cadillac's fins with its forward look. By 1957, bigger fins were better. Cadillac countered Chrysler with its 1957 Eldorado Brome. It spent $27,000 each for these big finned image cars. They sold them for a little over $13,000. The cars were crammed full of the latest technology and styling features. Two position memory seats, electric window vents, an automatic trunk opener, and the first transistor radio in a car. Women had built-in lipstick holders and a vanity kit, complete with a customized atomizer of Arpege perfume. Cadillac sold only 457 of these hand-built cars. They called it the car for those who could afford tomorrow's car today. Today, they're worth between 30 and $40,000. Cadillac's show cars 
were even more over the top. The real wow was about to come. In 1959, a bigger engine, better shock absorbers, and improved power steering were touted as sales features. But the only thing most people noticed was the fin. Cadillac had turned this car over to a young designer, Chuck Jordan, who went on to become GM's vice president of design. No one knew that these cars would become icons. They'd been featured on stamps, as art objects, on clothing, and in countless music videos, films, and commercials. The flamethrower taillights and rocket ship design are emblems for the era. While critics may deride them, be prepared to spend over $125,000 if you must have one. The fans of the Finns cooled slightly in 1960. There was nowhere else to go, so the Finns started to get smaller. The 60s was an era of change, and Cadillac, like all the other American cars, would feel the pressure from increasing competition. In the boom years after World War II, Cadillac and the rest of the American automobile industry have been able to sell almost anything they could build. The conventional wisdom was that if you could push it off the assembly line, it would sell. There was really no incentive to improve quality or safety, efficiency, or add advanced engineering features. There was no real competition from abroad. Germany, England, Italy, and Japan had all been devastated by the war. The few imports that trickled into the States were mostly seen as fun toys for the well-heeled or quirky cars for fringe buyers. These cars didn't pose a threat to Cadillac. But as companies like Mercedes recovered from the war, they refined their cars. They built high-quality vehicles with features like disc brakes and enhanced safety. People began to question the assumed leadership of the American automobile. Sales continued to grow throughout the decade. By the 1970s, Cadillac was selling over 200,000 cars a year. It had come a long way since that first car rolled out in 1903, but the challenges of the outside world would finally force Cadillac to change. The Organization of Petroleum Exporting States, or OPEC, turned off the oil spigot, and gas lines sprouted up all over America. The government imposed new fuel efficiency, environmental, and safety regulations that forced the automakers to rethink what they made. Suddenly, the pressure was on to downsize. The newer, smaller cars turned off their older, traditional buyers and never caught on with younger people who turned to BMW, Mercedes, and eventually the Japanese. A series of ill-fated cars like the Cimarron and the Alante further eroded the Cadillac image. Oddly enough, it was a truck-like vehicle that started to show that the company still had promise. The Escalade was a luxury version of the SUVs originally built for General Motors' other divisions. While some derided the gigantic SUVs, the success of the Escalade was one of the first indications that Cadillac had found a way to reach younger buyers. Finally, they had something to brag about. Other new vehicles followed, and it looked like Cadillac was regaining its confidence. There's still a long way to go before Cadillac can once again claim to be the standard of the world. But with any luck, it's on its way.
In the 1950s, Pontiac was facing a crisis. It had to change or vanish. Its cars were dull, and something new was needed now. They decided make good-looking, affordable cars that went fast. This simple idea saved Pontiac and spurred the development of one of the great automotive icons, the GTO. A new GTO hit the streets in 2004, 30 years after the original faded away. The reintroduction of America's first muscle car gave fans something to celebrate at the 2004 GTO National Convention. To welcome the new GTO, the organizers set this year's event in the center of GTO country. Pontiac, Michigan. Pontiac was the spawning ground of the first GTO. Over 1,000 people made the journey to share stories, look at one another's cars, and soak up the legend of the GTO. They discovered it had its roots in post-war America. The American economy took off after World War II. Pent-up demand, abundant jobs, and the money people had saved during the war triggered enormous sales for car makers. Under the guise of national defense, President Eisenhower pushed through the creation of an interstate highway system. These new roads fueled the growth of suburbs and transformed Americans into commuters. Suburbanites loved their cars and started spending more and more time on the road. The car makers had finally retooled after the war and were now turning out an endless array of new cars. The competition got tougher and tougher. Jim Wangers, an account executive for Pontiac's advertising agency, had an insider's view. The car shortage had kind of been uh, diminished after World War II. You know, during that immediate post-war era, everybody would drive whatever they could get their hands on. But by now, the market had been fulfilled, and people became more selective. Wengers found out that Pontiac was in trouble. Its cars were boring, reliable, but dull reality was that the car was a nice car and by now this was in the mid 50s you couldn't sell a nice car General Motors other divisions Chevrolet Buick Oldsmobile and Cadillac were zooming ahead but Pontiac was stuck its future was at stake it was actually the mid 50s that ultimately led General Motors to the conclusion that this division needed to have a major change, not only in its product development, but in the way in which the car was imaged and the car was marketed. GM executives began to think about killing off Pontiac. But GM's president, Harlow Curtis, wanted to rescue it. He knew just the right person for the job, the son of a former GM president, Bunky Knudsen. When Bunky took over Pontiac in July of 1956, he was sure he could transform it. He just wasn't sure how. Oldsmobile had a pretty good name for luxury and nice, comfortable size, and Chevrolet, which had a pretty good name for good, 
Quality, entry-level, low-priced merchandise were squeezing Pontiac from both top and bottom. And Pontiac had nothing to offer except just another nice car. Newton did a little polling. He asked his kids what they thought of Pontiacs. They politely told him. He had a lot of work to do. His son was only 15, but Newton knew that Pontiac had to appeal to the kids his age. They were part of the baby boomers who change everything. Ignore them at your peril. That was the stroke of genius. That was the one thing that Pontiac saw, the management team at Pontiac. And I like to think that I was kind of part of a contribution factor. We saw what was going to become the greatest market segment ever to hit this country, which was uh, the group we now call the baby boomers. Knudsen felt the boomers would respond to good-looking, affordable cars that had real performance. Fortunately, Pontiac had a strong V8. One way to get attention was to win some races. Nobody believed these stodgy cars could win, but Knudsen was determined to try. Well, they made up their mind that grandma, which is what they kind of laughingly called it, you know, the, the nice car, you know, that was built to last 100,000 miles, conservatively styled, conservatively powered, they decided that they were going to turn grandma into a teenager. Knudsen launched an assault on Florida's Daytona Speed Week and race in February of 1957. He hoped this would serve notice that Pontiac was changing. Monkey was a car guy. He understood performance. He understood young people. He understood performance cars. He understood that racing at that point was a very important thing to help build images. Newton's team churned up the sand and started to break records. One car clocked in at 141.2 miles per hour, the fastest time ever for an American car in its class. The speed tests and qualifying heats on the beach were just a warm up for the main event, the Daytona 500. At the time, this ragged contest was run on an oval course carved out of the beach and the scrub brush. Knudsen's cars were pitted against experienced teams from Ford, Chrysler, and Chevrolet. No one believed Pontiac had a chance. But lap after lap, they showed they could compete. They kept fighting. By the finish, Cotton Owens, a Pontiac driver, flew across the finish line and captured a win. The gods had smiled on Pontiac. Knudsen and Pontiac were on their way. To keep building Pontiac's image, he assembled a team that shared his passion for performance. He poached Pete Estes from Oldsmobile and snapped up a young engineer from the remains of Packard, John DeLorean. DeLorean was a little wild, but he was the best engineer Newton had ever met, and he knew what young people wanted. This dream team started building cars to ride the coming wave of baby boomers. Well, in the late 50s, most of those baby boomers were kids. They were 10, 11, maybe 12 years old. And they were just now coming into their own as an entity. And Pontiac was the first one to kind of recognize this because Mr. Knudsen you know, himself understood it as a, uh, as a manager and as a marketer. Their first effort hit the streets in 1959. The new, long, low, and wide look became known as the wide track. One of the most significant things about it is you could look at that car 
and immediately see that it had that wider tread. It was almost kind of a selling message of its own. You looked at the car and say, oh yeah, there's one of those wide track Pontiacs. The new look and racing success gave Pontiac the boost it needed. It jumped from sixth to fourth place in sales. Knudsen was rewarded with the top job at Chevrolet, but his team stayed to finish the work at Pontiac. By 1962, they knocked Rambler out of third place and were in line just behind Chevrolet and Ford. They were going strong, then the corporation dropped a bombshell, a ban on racing. It was an era when racing deaths were increasingly common. The big three auto companies didn't want the bad publicity associated with sponsoring something dangerous. They also feared that the public would pressure the government to add costly safety features to their passenger cars. The easy route, quit racing. This was a death sentence to Pontiac, but DeLorean had an idea. He liked the power of Pontiac's large 389 cubic inch engines and thought these big power plants would be great in a smaller car. In other words, take the biggest engine and stuff it into the smallest chassis, which is a trick the hot rod community had been doing for years. Well, Pontiac decided to do it as a manufacturer. It was more than GM's anti-racing rules allowed, but he snuck it past them and had a hot new car to launch in 1964. He called it the GTO. It was a stealthy introduction, no fanfare, but the dealers knew what DeLorean was doing, and they quickly ordered 5,000 GTOs. The muscle car era had begun. The car was at the right place at the right time, the GTO. And of course, when it hit the marketplace, it was an overnight smash. People liked the lack of chrome, its aggressive stunts, and most of all, its blistering performance. It had a list of options that allowed a buyer to veer towards speed or more luxury cruising. DeLorean wanted something that was part BMW and part hot rod. Young American drivers weren't looking for a European road car. They wanted something that was fast and good looking. The perfect cruising machine. And the Pontiac GTO was the absolute teenager's dream because it was a $2,500 car that could sit there and kind of thumb its nose at just about anybody out there. You know, cars costing twice as much. By 1965, it was a major success. Sales had jumped from 30,000 in 1964 to 75,000 by the end of the year. DeLorean rode the GTO to the top. He was named Pontiac's general manager. Pontiac soared with the GTO's success. It touched the nerve of the growing cruising scene. GTOs started to dominate Detroit's Woodward Avenue, the epicenter of the area's growing performance car culture. But the GTO didn't have the turf to itself. Chrysler, Ford, and Chevrolet introduced cars to compete. While challenged, DeLorean's GTO still ruled Woodward Avenue and its meeting grounds, the drive-ins. This was a very, very famous drive-in site. The name of the drive-in was the Totem Pole. It used to be a real serious hangout for most of the young folks who were out cruising, looking for girls as well as a race. 
which they could almost always find. It was really quite a thing with the drive-ins. Everybody pulled into the drive-in. You'd line up to get in to get a spot, and you would uh, chip in the money. Coke was 15 cents. Hot dogs were uh, 50 cents. Hamburgers were 45 cents. And you'd usually share one because you didn't have enough money because you had to buy gasoline. It was 18.9 during the uh, gas wars. Almost every night, over 2,000 street racers would come out. These baby boomers loved their hot cars and wanted to see what they could do. Four on the floor, three deuces, and a 389 meant Pontiacs and cruising Woodward. Detroit's Woodward Avenue was, and still is, perfectly suited for cruising. But fueled by a heady mix of burgers, fries, and Cokes, blended with raging hormones and stirred by performance cars, young people engaged in a high-test mating ritual on streets all over the country. Well, we would wait there for a certain person to come through. We wanted to go race, and then we would follow them out and go line up on the next traffic light, as many as four abreast, and have at it. It was the car culture, the competition, bragging rights was so important of who beat who, because it lasted forever. DeLorean's engineers, designers, and executives also got into the act. They'd leave work and head down to Woodward to see how their cars fared against the regulars. We had very famous names coming out here. John DeLorean, George DeLorean, uh, very famous names that uh, all started out here on Woodward Avenue. To keep the GTO on top, Pontiac's engineers used what they learned on Woodward to develop performance enhancements that dealers could sell. GTO's racing was not confined to the streets. Even though Pontiac couldn't officially sponsor racing, they helped drivers take their cars to drag strips. The cars performed and helped to spread the word that the GTO was hot. Fans have preserved many of these winning Pontiacs and still take them out to show just how amazing they were. In 1969, DeLorean was given the top job at GM's largest division, Chevrolet. His replacement, Jim McDonald, didn't have the same passion for performance or feel for what young people wanted. The GTO was still a winner, but times were changing. The new GTO judge, inspired by a comedy bit from a popular television variety show, was feeling the competition. Pontiac's lineup started to lose its grip on the marketplace. Plymouth muscled in on their third place roost. It was clear that the 70s were going to be a tough race. The 1970s were a challenging decade for America's performance cars. Government mandated reductions in leaded fuels made automakers lower engine compression ratios. Power dropped. Other emission controls sapped more power. And then fuel economy standards prompted by gas shortages took the muscle out of the muscle cars. Then the police started to target the cruisers on Woodward. It was a hard time. They eventually put signs up that said no cruising through drive-ins. And if you went through and didn't buy an item like a Coca-Cola, you'd get a ticket. And so that was the beginning of the end of the drive-ins. By 1974, the GTO also was history. Gone, but not forgotten. Fans kept them, restored them, took them out for cruises, and even passed them down. These were cars that memories were made of. 
I originally purchased a GTO in 1965. I met my wife when I had one of these and uh, just kind of reflect on all the things that I did back in those days. And I found this uh, up in Sacramento and just started from there, started rebuilding it. And the thrill is never gone. No one thought the GTO would return, but GM's Australian subsidiary, Holden, was building a high performance car that caught Detroit's eye. After some modifications, this car was brought to the States and launched as the new GTO. GTO loyalists were somewhat miffed because they thought their ideas about the new GTO were ignored by GM. Many didn't like the car's looks. The 40th anniversary was the first time that most would get a chance to actually see one in person and see how it performed. Pontiac tapped a noted rally driver, Rhys Millen, to take the unconvinced for a test drive. He showed how the GTO handled the new sport of drifting. Usually when people hop out of the car, they, they really don't have much to say but scream and holler, you know. It's, it's, it's another thing to watch it from the outside, but as you got to experience to sit in the passenger seat, um, you know, you see the cones coming or the barriers out there and it looks like you're gonna slide right into them. Um, but, but your judgment of distance and speed is so precise that you can run right up and touch a cone or touch a barrier and still be in control. Um, so it, it's, it's dynamic, um, it works, and it's exciting sitting in here or watching it. While it wasn't a classic cruiser, the riders couldn't deny its power and agility. I'm impressed. They're going to sell a ton of them, probably. <laughs> They'll sell a ton of them. Big fun. But it's fun. What a right? performance. Oh, oh God. <laughs> Got a new ride of my life. Get back in line. Even drag racing legend Arnie Bestwick, who'd won the first NHRA championship in 1953 and later survived a near fatal racing fire, couldn't believe how the car performed. So what kind of car you got out here? 67 GTM. It's a fun, fun car. And I, I could forget the styling. I might not like all that well because of the performance of the car. It's just, it's just breathtaking. It's breathtaking. I'll tell you what, when you get that thing up, like over four... Kip Wasenko, director of GM's performance division styling department, assembled a team to create a new vision for the GTO in time for the 2004 Woodward Dream Cruise. We have listened to, to what people have said, so we've digested and taken those words to heart. I think we've addressed the car to give it more muscle, uh, much more presence, but it's still true to what a GTO is. Wasenko's team members had deep feelings about the GTO. They wanted to make sure they got it right this time. When I was 17 years old, my mother went out and bought a brand new 1965 GTO. And that was a, that was a, that was a car that people took notice of. Well, the GTO today, they don't take notice of this one. They'll take notice of. This has got the stance. It's a little more futuristic. It's got the heritage to it. That's what I like about it. The classic GTOs have been making us feel good for years. And it looks like a GTO will once again provide a new generation with the excitement of high performance thrills. The glory days of the muscle car era can't be recreated, but they'll never be forgotten. <laughs>